Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. DiscerningHearts.com presents St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. Father Haggerty is a priest of the Archdiocese of New York who serves at St. Patrick's Cathedral. He taught moral theology and worked as a spiritual director in seminaries for 20 years. He has directed numerous yearly retreats for the missionaries of charity. He is the author of Contemplative Provocations, The Contemplative Hunger, Conversion, Contemplative Enigmas, and St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, the book on which this series is based. St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Father Haggerty, thank you so much for joining me once again. Thank you, Chris, for having me. It's such a trap. I think growing up as a child in the 60s and the 70s, our generation was one of the first to have that constant onslaught on television. Saturday mornings, you have to have this toy. You have to have this thing. And if you if you didn't get it, but your friends got it, then somehow my parents didn't love me enough to give me this. And so then we, we get older and then we have kids. Well, I'm going to show you how much I love you. I'm going to give you all those things that I didn't get, or I'm going to get all those things now that I'm older that I couldn't get, but now I can because I have the funds. It is uh, that trying to seek it, the desire of the heart, the pleasure thing. And, and somehow in our, the back of our minds, we still say, but I can love God, but I also want this and I can get it. So I'm going to get it. There it is. Where's your treasure? What is it really is your ultimate goal? And that is a real challenge. And I, I have to wonder if as a diocesan priest and one who deals with souls every day, but also one who has, has a wonderful relationship of knowing the missionaries of charity, that's quite a shift, isn't it? I mean, 180 degrees both ways, isn't it? Well, certainly. And, but, you know, New York City is, I mean, I love New York. I love New York City. And in part because you know, you have always uh, contact with poor people here. You know, and some of it is the difficulty of homelessness. I mean, sure, that's true in so many of the cities in the United States, but also um, loneliness. You know, Mother Teresa, you know, mentioned after she opened up her houses in the West, and she has more houses in the United States than any other country in the world other than India which is a bit striking. She would say again and again, the greatest you know, poverty in this world is, is the lonely person, the loneliness of people who have no one in their life. And sometimes that is the poor person on the street who are not always you know, mentally ill. Sometimes their, their lives really just got broken at some point. And you know, that kind of uh, poverty is, is there. There are many people well-dressed who have serious loneliness in their life. You know, I think the, you know, the question, I think most parents, perhaps my parents would say the same, you know, we, we want you, you would want your children to be happy. But St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, when he, that's one of his early questions. in when he begins his moral section in the, in the Summa Theologiae, and he's going to ask about happiness, what really is happiness? And that question is, is answered in such diverse ways by people as they go through life. So how we come to discover the real reality, you know, that God can offer us of a happiness with him. The problem is that many people don't, don't discover it. And, you know, without good family life or uh, if we in some manner get off track or off the rails in early life or in college years, or then, you know, it's something is going to step in there as the aspiration for what would seem to be happiness in life. And sometimes material things or ambitions, you know, the never achieved, you know, goals that 
accumulate in life. And, you know, all of this is, you know, it's why John of the St. John of the Cross, even though, you know, it seemed to be appealing to the contemplative person, he has such wisdom. We see there's such wisdom in much of this kind of writing because it is, it has its roots in the gospel. If you seek to, you know, find yourself and seek yourself, you're going to lose, you know, yourself. You're going to lose the true identity that you had before God in his image and likeness. But if you lose yourself out of love for him, then, you know, this greater experience of real companionship with God begins and deepens as a life goes on. So the question of happiness is a, is a good one. Like where, where did you, where do any of us find our real happiness in life? It might be at the table, you know, it might be, you know, where do we find the great happiness of our life? That says much of a soul. Yeah, I thought that was so helpful when in the book you reminded us of St. John of the Cross and his studies at the University of Salamanca and grounded in Thomistic teaching in the in the writings of St. Thomas. He would have had to have had that that first question posed to him as though this is his response to that, isn't it? Yes, and it's um, you know it's good that you make mention of that because the the Thomistic background of Saint John of the Cross in his theology training there would have taught him also Saint Thomas's teaching on the human will, and just to you know place it in a bit of a quick summary, you know Saint Thomas's teaching it's it's a really an important spiritual teaching you know for all of us. He instructs, teaches that the human will really has three distinct operations that are affecting us um, in, our, in our spiritual life. And if we you know, understand, too, what spirituality has always said, it's the human will in union with God's will that always will be, a, in a sense, a description of sanctity, of holiness, to give our will fully to the will of God, you know, as Mary did at the Annunciation. I am your handmaid, let it be done now in accord with your word, giving her will, her whole being to God. The three operations that St. Thomas will teach, and this is so much present in the writing too of St. John of the Cross in a kind of implicit manner, is the first operation is the will in desire. So the human person, you know, in desire, in inclination for something. So that doesn't mean I'm choosing it. Like if I look at, if I walk past a, uh, you know, a pizza place, you know, and the, the nice aroma of pizza is, you know, wafting out into the street. So, and I'm in a rush, but the, the, the desire initially that can come through senses, it can come from something we read or a prayer, that the initial impact on the will of desire. And one of the things St. Thomas is teaching there is that the desire of the will needs to be provoked by something known in the mind. So some awareness. So when I see something, when I have my mind attentive to something that is attractive, then the will does experience an inclination and desire toward it. So that's true with human persons. If you, if you, uh, if you love somebody and they're not with you, but your mind is very much taken up with that person, you know, the desire to be with them will be inclining the will, you know, even in times of, of separation and absence. Or a more just basic example, if if you bought a nice chocolate cake, you know, to have with your, uh, you know, your family, uh, your brother or sister, you know, this, this evening, and you're, you're looking forward to that chocolate cake, you're not eating it yet, but the desire of the will is affected by that initially. And the desire of the will is, is really key, you know, as we go on in life, it affects the life of prayer so much. Longings for God, you know, being attentive to that deeper longing for him 
the will is in a sense inflamed you know in love for our lord as we go on in spiritual life if we're serious in prayer and commitment to him and that first operation of the will then plays a great role in in growth spiritually and it's part of it that's really what jesus perhaps was saying when he said where your treasure is there will your heart be also what you value and treasure that comes back repeatedly to our mind our attention our awareness that causes a great longing a desire in the heart in the des in the desire of the will so that's the first operation and then if if i would continue with that the second operation is what we're very familiar with when we actually choose something so when we make a choice and you know we choose for something we choose to accept something we give in and you know give ourselves to something or we refuse refuse something we say no in that moment or we make even a greater act of renunciation towards something when we surrender or we offer something see these acts of interior will sometimes many times with actions accompanying them you know that's the second operation and that's crucial too spiritually you know not just what we choose or what we refuse but the intensity of that you know the more mother teresa loved the world the word to be wholehearted to you know give oneself wholeheartedly wholehearted and free service to the poorest of the poor is in their constitutions but to be wholehearted to, to give ourselves fully to the choices we make in that second operation of the will and then the third operation is the the experience in the will of a certain satiation the will satisfied you know enjoying or taking delight when i desire something and then i'm able to choose it you know, maybe longing for something for a while, then I'm able to choose it. The will itself undergoes a certain delight then, a resting in that choice. The action itself, the choice becomes, you know, delightful or enjoyable, you know, not just because the action is maybe enjoyable, but the will itself has that satisfaction. And just as a last point on that, that pattern, you know, the will in inclination or desire, followed by choosing, followed by some satiation or delight, that plays so much into spiritual life and the life of virtue or the life of vice because it rotates. The things I desire and I'm able to choose, and then I find some satiation, some satisfaction in them, they rotate back then to become desires again. So a lot of, you know, we could say spiritual life is, you know, if we acquire the taste, for instance, in prayer, if we begin to experience something that, you know, is not like other things in life that are just physically, you know, enjoyable or comfortable in our lives, but we begin to taste more of that deeper attraction for the personal presence of our Lord in front of a tabernacle or a monstrance in prayer, the beauty, the taste of going to mass every day, a taste for the scripture, you know, finding more things there. If we build, you know, up some, if we're beginning building desire there, we're choosing and then finding delight in that, those things, then that motor starts rotating through this. And, you know, then in a sense, then we begin to, we're on the way, you know, toward God in a stronger way then. It really, it, it's a difference that when it, we're oriented towards that conversion, that, that life in Christ, that it is grace that ends up becoming the transformative action in our lives. That encounter, that continually ongoing, helps us to be able to be sustained when inevitably in life suffering comes in whatever manner that might be. It might be the suffering from even denial of an activity, or it may be something that it actually affects us physically, or it's an, an endurance of a, an emotional pain from a loved one or whatever that might be that 
because of those choices in the will and that opening up to grace, it can make that transformative. But if there's a dearth of that, if we haven't chosen that, then that suffering, whatever it is, can be almost like a, a like a black hole, can it? That's true. Yeah. And, and I think the, uh, the, the question can be also, you know, what God, you know, brings to us. And I, I don't think that we would ever say, you know, we should desire suffering. No, we don't want to desire suffering. But the fact is that, you know, God has his own way, you know, every life is going to be tested in certain ways. And we don't have to be close to God to suffer. We see that much in the world. And, you know, this great suffering in, in, in the lives of poor people in third world countries, you know, terrible suffering. And, you know, God has his way of being close to people in their suffering. But the other reality of this is, you know, not we don't desire suffering, but we must desire to love him and to want to know him and in a sense to want to know him in his true you know reality of love to know him in his passion and i'm sure it's true these saints would tell us in heaven that they came to know our lord more deeply by allowing the passion of christ mysteriously to enter into their own lives more so something can shift to then in our our life of desire you know not so much that we are choosing to you know not ever you know to choose to inflict pain on ourselves that's not you know the proper approach to spiritual life but the you know it, it's a great thing when a person can find delight in things that previously were simply you know, burdensome and avoided at all costs. And now they begin to find their delight in them. Why? Because uh, there, is, there is an opportunity to offer to our Lord with greater faith, realizing, you know, that that offering can be touching the heart of our Lord, that faith has grown to the point where they really do believe, a person believes that in offering some suffering, and making an act, you know, in that second operation to offer that that really does have an effect, perhaps offered for a soul, that maybe somebody dying in this moment is given the grace of salvation because of that offering. And then our Lord, you know, touched in heart by that act. Much of spiritual life, you could say, is in that question, what do we desire? You know, what do we choose? What do we delight in? Even, you know, what you didn't mention, it's a, you know, most of those things have, they have a reverse, you know, side to them. What are we frustrated by? And there are good holy frustrations, you know, which John of the Cross will talk about too in prayer. So the ability to face, you know, frustrations with, you know, a certain equanimity, you know, not getting thrown back and upset by things that are part of God's, you know, working with us. And suffering is an aspect of that. Oh, you're starting to sound like St. Therese now, the little flower. It's the little way, isn't it? Yeah, the, the, the small things, but, you know, and also large things. You know, there, there can be uh, larger trials that people undergo. Certainly, you know, I'm a priest, but I've heard of these things in marriages. Sometimes it's in, in family life. I've heard so many times now, parents sometimes suffer, you know, a great deal from their children. You know, so it's not just small things, you know, the little irritations that could be there in, in a workplace or certainly in a Carmelite convent, but things that you have to live with, you know, over long periods of time and, you, you know, usually in human relations. So those things offered up when, when there's a different perspective and vision on them they can be also open doors to, to God in deep ways. And, you know, if you, and we started talking about asceticism initially, and some of these uh, you can see now perhaps is a better picture on it, that when you're able to, you know, say no to things, you know, not just giving into preference and accepting, you know, difficult things, whatever food is on the plate or being happy, you know, even complimenting who's ever cooking, no matter what it is, 
And these kind of practices are, you know, opening us up also to accept all that God permits in our life, that everything really is providentially from the hand of God. So, you know, the small thing of what's on the plate can lead in time, you know, to a deeper realization, whatever God, you know, places, you know, into our life. Yes, that is part of his gift. I don't think it could have been summed up more beautifully than how you brought this particular chapter and St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, uh, to a close with that prayer, Father Haggerty. It is so powerful. I, I've taken it out and I'm beginning to try to pray it maybe once or twice a day. Probably we'll be doing it more. Do you happen to have a copy of the book in front of you, Father? Uh, yes, I do. It's on page 126. Would you mind reading that? Yeah, before I read that, I'm glad you mentioned it, Chris, because, you know, it's a beautiful statement. I mean, you think this is at the end of a section on, you know, asceticism, but it's such a beautiful statement of spiritual life. And with, again, a repetition on the word desire, and it's really saying, as we're about to hear it, you know, to be able to give all to God, you know, and to have our desire filled, you know, with this one consuming, you know, desire for God. So it, it does read beautifully. And it's so much, you know, this is John of the Cross at his best. So it reads as follows, to reach satisfaction in all, desire satisfaction in nothing, to come to possess all, desire the possession of nothing, to arrive at being all, desire to be nothing, to come to the knowledge of all, desire the knowledge of nothing, to come to enjoy what you have not, you must go by a way in which you enjoy not, to come to the knowledge you have not, you must go by a way in which you know not. To come to the possession you have not, you must go by a way in which you possess not. To come to be what you are not, you must go by a way in which you are not. When you delay in something, you cease to rush toward the all. For to go from the all to the all, you must deny yourself of all in all. And when you come to the possession of the all, you must possess it without wanting anything. Because if you desire to have something in all, your treasure in God is not purely your all. In this nakedness, the spirit finds its quietude and rest. For in coveting nothing, nothing tires it by pulling it up, and nothing oppresses it by pushing it down because it is in the center of its humility. When it covets something, by this very fact, it tires itself. It's a great statement. And to cast oneself upon the all. There are great phrases in that. Well, that's why he's the doctor of the church. A great physician for our spiritual life, isn't he? He certainly is. He's... And it's, it's an interesting, you know, again, that kind of statement, it plays out through the entirety of the spiritual life. It's interesting how he will say, you know, when you covet something in this very, you know, fact of coveting, you weary your soul. And it's so true, you know, of what happens in, in life, in the world, coveting after things, you know, we end up only wearying the soul and in a sense, taking us away from that, what could be that path toward God. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Father Haggerty. Well, thank you, Chris, for having me. I appreciate these, uh, these conversations. You've been listening to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation with Father Donald Haggerty. This series is based on the book, St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, published by Ignatius Press. Visit Ignatius.com to obtain a copy, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit DiscerningHearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app.
This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation with Father Donald Haggerty.